Again, my name is Yuich. Um, I am uh, I'm faculty at the University of Minnesota. I teach in the Department of African American and African Studies and also Asian American Studies. Um, this event is, is put together um, in partnership with Eastside Freedom Library. Um, how many of you have been here before? Just wanted to see. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I, I also sit on the board here. Um, but as you know, Eastside Freedom Library has been around since, Clarence? Well, it's five and a half years. Yes, one, yeah, five and a half years. Um, it's truly a, uh, a community-based uh, labor history, immigration history, education center of sorts. And I really think has become a, a sort of a pace setter for doing creative things and much needed sort of intellectual kind of a dynamism in times like now. And, um, but all this is to say that so the College of Liberal Arts, to which I'm part of at the University of Minnesota, um, has given um, funding opportunities. It's called Interdisciplinary Collaborative Workshop. And the objective of this workshop is to really work across disciplines and across school institutions and schools, um, both within and outside. So faculty members and community activists came together to create a sort of working group to think about the future of the struggles of labor in our time. And uh, we called ourselves after Janus, Janus from, from the U.S. Supreme Court case ruling that sort of represents the current moment's assault and attack on, on a state's attack on labor. And we wanted to start envisioning, um, exploring different kinds, more independent labor organizing capacity and initiative and dynamism, specifically worker center idea then and now. Um, connected to our own work as well as our own intellectual investment. Um, and we've been doing a lot of um, study group leading different texts. Um, and, um, and Peter Cole's work sort of came to, came to the fore as well and from other colleagues and we decided that, you know, Peter's work would be very much informative in thinking about the kinds of labor struggles that we see today particularly, let's say, around struggling against, um, struggling at the point of production, particularly in, in resistance to global supply chain. And I just learned about the Amazon workers, work, uh, uh, sort of, not strike, but walkout uh, that happened in Eden. Um, anyway, all this is to say that this has been a very much a collaborative project. In Eastside Freedom Library, I sit on the board, um, and Peter was also my teacher at McAllister College. Um, and um, he has worked tirelessly, I think, to create a very much sort of space like here that allows exchange of ideas about the past and also the present and to make connections. So Peter Cole's scholarship sort of is certainly in, in that sort of a realm um, that we envision. So I want to give an introduction to Peter, his, his bio. Um, I've been spending a lot of time with, with Peter. Um, I've read some of his work, not as extensively as I should, but I've always known him as, as a leading scholar of, of the history of Wobblies. Um, but his first book, there are two uh, single author books. Um, the first book was entitled Wobblies on the Waterfront, um, Interracial Unionism and Progressive Era, Philadelphia, published by University of Illinois Press in 2007. The second book, which is also an award-winning book, I think awarded by the Labor History Association, um, it's called Doc Walker Power, which he will present today. So those are the two single author books that he has published. In addition, he has edited um, the Bill Fletcher's The Black Wobbly. Ben Fletcher. What's that? Ben Fletcher. Ben Fletcher, I'm so sorry. Ben Fletcher, The Life and Writings of Black Wobbly, published by, published by Charles H. Carp. Publishing House in 2007. He's also, I have a copy of it, The Wobblies of the World. It's a collection anthology of just different types of um, Wobblies formations around the world, um, published in 2017 by Prudhoe Press. And he also is pretty prolific in terms of production of knowledge and ideas. He writes for scholarly journals as well as popular magazines and newspapers. Um, I'm not going to name a lot, but from Washington Post to you know, Jacobin and in these times and so forth. Um, so I want to really, truly want welcome, I want to help, please help me welcome Peter Cole uh, for this talk and 
thank you all for coming. And then he'll talk for about, I'll say, 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll open up for, for dialogue. Um, okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to you each for the introduction and to Peter Ratcliffe who couldn't be here right. tonight and others at the Eastside Freedom Library for making this visit of mine possible. I've known about this place since it was born because I've known Peter Ratcliffe for a while. But it's such a pleasure to be here and I appreciate that on a Friday night, here you are listening to a historian talk, hopefully interesting. Um, if not, you can always walk. But um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk about this subject, Software for Power. In a way, I already just told you what the book's about, the title. Uh, tells us what the subject is, Doc Worker Power. Um, and I'm happy to talk about sort of methods and research and all that if one wants, but really what I'm going to do um, primarily is tell you about the book, which is not a history uh, in terms of a chronology from A to Z, from, uh, but instead it's more thematic, right? And there's really three themes in the book that I'm going to tell you about, some uh, listed here, yeah. Like, I, in particular, um, I also happen to be a member of a union. I'm a teacher and I'm part of the American Federation of Teachers. But uh, I'm a big fan of unions. Unions make workers make more money, all sorts of things. In addition to that, however, uh, not at all about how union, unions benefit people who are in unions. Right? It's actually about how unions can use their power to help other people, including themselves. Right? Um, and in other words, how unions, as one sort of social movement, can in fact fight for other just causes. Uh, and in particular, in our society, in the United States, but also in South Africa, the other country that I focus upon, both societies committed to and sort of built on the foundations of what we may call racial capitalism, right? The sort of the twin notions of white supremacy and capitalism that sort of come of age together, that these two societies um, are diverse in their ethnic and racial makeup, but also sort of committed to uh, racism, right? From their inception. And that so we have a multiracial societies in both places, and we might think about, okay, how unions can be a part of organizing in a multiracial society, because working classes are always more diverse than the upper classes. Um, and um, not only, therefore, to fight for, say, um, short-term economic gains, but also sort of long-term uh, equality, right? Um, including, but not only, racial equality. Um, that was why I started to do this work, for reasons that you'll hopefully become aware of when I tell you about how these different dock workers did that sort of thing. Um, as I started to do my research, I then became increasingly aware that, gosh, these dock workers not only fought for racial equality in their home places, they also fought for black liberation in other countries, right? what sometimes we now call transnational activism. And that was, in a way, the second theme uh, that I started to get drawn to. And that very much fits into my earlier work, the sort of the intersections between uh, multiracial workers and organizing. Um, however, as I was doing more work, I kept on running into this issue, technological change, technological change, sometimes we call this automation, and in the industry I'm going to tell you about um, shipping, uh, often called containerization, not a term that we use very much, nor would we want to because it's a horrible word, um, but super important. And guess what? In the 21st century, if there's not an industry where technological change is impacting workers, I don't know what that industry is. Um, and so I decided to essentially uh, devote a significant part of my research and book to looking at how a workforce experienced a radically um, new and important technology that has world historic implications um, in ways that I hope I'll uh, help you understand too. Right? And so, that one doesn't quite fit with the other two, but nevertheless um, became really central to the story I'm telling. And um, hopefully you appreciate that. You know, I am very much a historian, like Yuich was saying, who's thinking about, um, in the way that Howard Zinn did, um, searching for a usable past, right? Um, we don't just study these things because they're interesting, although some of us might care about that, but also what I can do with them. Right? Like, uh, um, for me, that's always been central to my um, purpose as a teacher as well as as a scholar. So this is the one thing I'm going to read, right? Um, I'm not going to talk much about the idea of doing comparative history, but if one wants to talk about that, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, instead, I'm just going to read you a quote from Robert F. Kennedy, who was a U.S. Senator from the state of New York who visited South Africa in 1966, two years before he was killed. Mm, I have a drinking problem. 
um, Robert F. Kennedy pictured here in South Africa in 1966. Um, I came here because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid 17th century, then taken over by the British and at last independent. A land in which the native inhabitants were first subdued, but relations with remains a problem to this day. A land which defined itself on a hostile frontier. A land which has tamed rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology. A land which once imported slaves and now must struggle to wipe out the last traces of that former bondage. I refer, of course, to the United States of America. And now you're supposed to laugh. Right uh, because he's in South Africa, he just described South African history, but for those of us who are Americans, you might have thought, and he was in fact, right, talking about the United States too, right? And so, if we want to have a conversation about why these two places share much in common, happy to have that conversation, but I'm just going to work in the assumption that we all accept that, right? Um, so that otherwise we could go down a rabbit hole. Um, so, I also work on the assumption the United States that most people don't really know much about South Africa, and correct me when I'm wrong. Um, but that big red arrow that tells us where Durban, South Africa is, is on the southeast coast of Africa, um, the Indian Ocean. And South Africa also has a coast on the Atlantic side, right? But um, I'm focused on the Indian Ocean port Durban, which was the uh, most important port in South Africa going back to the early 20th century, and remains that to this day. Um, it's also the busiest port in all of Africa. Um, Sometimes in North Africa, there's a port in between Morocco that surpasses it in cargo volume, but like one of the biggest ports in the world, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, right? Um, the image on the right is from the mid 20th century, but it, Durban still harbor looks like that uh, with some, you know, some minor changes. Um, so we're looking over land and we're looking sort of westward, right? If we were in a plane. And um, the harbor, well, right in the center, right? Nar very, very, very narrow mouth to the harbor, which is sort of interesting. Um, and then the city proper is really to the right of the screen, which is actually northward, yeah. um, with the, the work being uh, on what's called the point, which was this part of the peninsula. Although with containers, um, modern day cranes and whatnot, actually the entire harbor moved to the south harbor, although this is all Durban, right? Durban in South Africa. It's in the province called Natal, and now it's called Fazul Natal. San Francisco, more familiar, I assume. Um, the best harbor on the west coast of North America, right, period. Yeah, um, uh, it is the place that, although it actually has also a narrow mouth, much wider than the Durban Harbor, but relatively narrow, um, what the Spanish referred to as the Golden Gate, um, many decades and centuries before there was a bridge that spanned the Golden Gate, right, um, opens up into this ginormous harbor that's actually several hundred square miles, right, um, and provides um, excellent protection from the storms of the ocean on the east side of the city of San Francisco on this peninsula in the south, right? Um, subsequent to um, containerization, which I'll talk more about, literally the harbor, the port moves to what is Oakland and Alameda on the east bay, right? Um, and this is just a great photograph of 1850 San Francisco uh, when it was a bustling harbor right at the beginning. One of the things that Durban and San Francisco share in common, although it's not why I chose to do this research, is that um, both are the closest ports to the gold fields, right? Um, because really, California booms because of the gold of the San Francisco being the most logical place to get all the stuff, also people and everything in. Durban is actually the closest South African harbor to Johannesburg, which in the late 1800s became actually the, the single largest gold fields in the world, right? And produced massive amounts of gold. Subsequently, platinum and other things too, but really gold, right? And so it's something that they have to share in common. I am interested in port cities. I am appreciative that we are in a small port place along a big river, even though Minneapolis isn't really sort of a great port city as we think about it in the world, right? Um, uh, river cities, yeah, are no longer significant in terms of um, shipping, um, with a few exceptions, right? Um, but Durban and San Francisco, but I also could be talking about Hamburg in Germany, or Valparaiso in Chile, or Sydney in Australia, or Singapore, right, et cetera, right, um, are very interesting places. Right? They're where people come together. Um, people who are different from each other, people from different places, who bring with them, of course, stuff, cargo, trade, yeah, which is really central to these places' existence. Before there was capitalism, there was trade. And after capitalism, there will be trade. Right? Like, uh, we do not want to sort of mix up those two things. Right? Um, people exchange stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need the system that we currently have. Right? Um, but trade right, has, is, is the central reason that port cities grew, and that they were on water is not 
surprising because it's actually still the simplest way to move heavy stuff long distance at a relatively easy price and pace, right? Like, uh, and so port cities um, are sort of really because of that, but of course, what else is coming off these ships? People and ideas, right? Um, and so port cities are really interesting because it's where a lot of different people come together, right? Um, and form something new and different, right? But also people are exposed to new ideas, to new people, to new cultures. Um, I live much of my life in a small town. I'm not hating on a small town, but there's not many new people who come to my town on a regular basis, right? And so we don't get this refresh of ideas and different cultures and places. Port cities are such places. I always tell people when I'm in the Bay Area, if you think you know San Francisco and you don't put the port at the center of your knowledge about why San Francisco is the way it is, you actually don't know San Francisco. It's San Francisco's, all the things that you think about, the beats, homosexuals, whatever, hippies, it's all because it was a port city that actually it grew out of that, right? Like, uh, so too other cities, right? It's not unique to the Bay Area. is also very interesting. And port cities are also often places that are not just more tolerant, but more internationally minded, more open not just to new ideas, but actually in some ways more radical, because they accept people who are different than them, uh, which is, I think, bigger than tolerance, but also um, places where um, change comes from. Yeah? Um, and, you know, like, I'm also mindful that not everyone likes that. Um, and so when the mayor of Gdansk in Poland was murdered less than two years ago um, by anti-xenophobic, excuse me, by xenophobic, homophobic people who didn't like his politics, right, um, I like to point out this quote that I pulled from an obituary for the man, um, that Gdansk is a port and is a refuge, right? Like, uh, um, in our times, I think that also is noteworthy, right, that these port cities are really interesting. So I think they're really cool places for us to sort of understand, right? Um, but uh, to understand that, we do have to think about the economy. And for the economy, um, we should not just be thinking about individual port cities, but systems, yeah? And, and so when we think about the rise in the last 500 plus years of the Western world, right, coming out of Europe, Western Europe, right? Um, with this comes the so-called age of exploration, which we could also call imperialism, right? Um, and we could also call this the rise of capitalism, right? Um, and the ship is really the central player in making this a reality, right? Like, the way Europe conquers the world is through Portuguese and then Spanish and then British ships, right? Who are then bringing back stuff to the Western European countries, resources, people, profit, etc. Right? Um, and so we really should be thinking about maritime shipping as sort of central to our world. Right? Of course, some of us already do think in these ways. Um, now, we also are familiar with the word strike, but a lot of people are unfamiliar with the maritime origins of that word. Um, in the 1760s, when a group of sailors wanted to get a raise in London, um, then the biggest port in the world, uh, they took down the sails of their ship. They stopped work. Right? Um, but of course, the maritime term for um, taking down the sails of your ship is to strike the sail. Um, and that becomes the de facto term for work stoppages. That also gives us a little clue into how important maritime is for capitalism and for work, right? That the term we use for work stop actually is a maritime seafaring term. Yeah. Um, now, dock workers are fascinating in many ways, but let me just tell you a little about um, the nature of the work that they do. So traditionally, before the 1960s, for millennia, the work hadn't been that much different, right? Um, it was really backbreaking labor in which men, pretty much all men, would work, uh, 10, 20, 100 men would work a ship to load or unload it. Um, it would be uh, sort of generally manual labor. There is skill involved, especially loading. Every ship is different, every cargo is different, every commodity is different. Loading a ship so it's evenly balanced so it does not in fact sink um, is actually an incredible skill. Right. Uh, this work was, though, unskilled, according to sort of employers, right? Um, and uh, often you had to work not only in gangs, because no one could load or unload a ship by themselves, you often worked in pairs, right? Um, and so the nature of the work creates a really collective sense of identity, right? Not all work does. I'm a teacher, right? I prepare my lectures, I don't consult with someone else, I go into my class, I grade. It's very solitary, right? Like, not all types of work, in fact, are collective in their orientation. Traditionally, dock work was not only, but that's important because why do we see this industry, past and present, more much more heavily unionized than it, most others? That's part of the reason. Right? Like, uh, um, there's also a, a strict division between bosses and workers, and uh, zero chance for advancement into the ranks of the bosses. Right? Like, so social mobility doesn't really exist. And um, if you were a sailor, actually, you literally could be beaten to death by the captain. 
And it was only in the 20th century, the early 20th century, that sailors received constitutional rights. Um, uh, before that time, essentially, sailors were slaves, right? I mean, they could be legally beaten by their employer, right? Like, uh, it was only in the World War I era that it changed in America, right? And so, strict division between us and them, what are we talking about? Development of class consciousness, right? Like, the development of workers who are thinking about themselves as a group, and the employer as another group, who's often the opponent, not our friend. Um, now, I'll talk more about that in moments, but, like, that's important to understand that um, time and again we see workers acting collectively, often for short-term gain. I want to raise, right? Um, I want to save for work, yeah. Um, but I am going to highlight for you folks um, how this is also done to fight for other causes that might be equally interesting and important, um, what I call a black equality. Um, so let me tell you a little about each of these two places. Comparative history is hard. I'm telling two stories in one, yeah. So in San Francisco, which was, until the 1970s, the most important port in the West, yeah, and the most important city, perhaps. LA will surpass it in population, later economically, and in the 1970s, actually now, LA Long Beach is a more important port. Why? One of the reasons is it's a little closer to China, right? Like, because uh, time is money, and in this industry, that is the key. That's why those sailors struck in 1768 in London to get a raise, because they knew that if they slowed things down, the employer would lose profit. It might be, therefore, just wiser to concede the demand. Right? Like, uh, and so this is not unique to shipping. There are other parts of the logistics or transportation industry or supply chain that, in fact, is the same thing. Right? Um, it's not, in other words, only dock workers who have this potential power at what we now call a choke point right, in global capitalism. But like, it is something to think about. Um, Harry Bridges, pictured on the left, was a sailor. He came from Australia, um, nicknamed the Nose. And Harry Bridges was, uh, as a young man, um, basically was sensitized to the oppression of the world because he saw poverty when he got off ships in India and China um, and said, geez, this is really horrible. Like a lot of people who see poverty and oppression and feel sympathy for and want to do something about making things a little better, right? Like uh, he ends up making um, San Francisco his home moves around a bit in the US. But in the 1930s, as a dock worker for about a decade, helps lead a strike, even though he comes out of the rank and file, right? Um, and ultimately becomes the longtime president of a union called the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, ILWU. Uh, that's an acronym I'll use more than once. Um, now, Bridges, um, let me also just note that in the 1990s, they degendered their name, which is one of the many interesting things about this union. Uh, but at that time, it would not have been inaccurate even if it was sex-driven, right, in their name. Uh, so um, out of the so-called big strike of 1934, was there a big strike in Minneapolis in 1934? Hell yes, right? Like um, uh, 1934 was a big year for, in the throes of the Great Depression, worker militancy, including worker organizing to form powerful unions, and in many other industries as well, right? Like in any other parts of the US. But on the West Coast, for the summer of 34, they basically shut down every port on the West Coast. Um, in San Francisco, it briefly became a general strike after police killed several strikers uh, in what became known as the San Francisco General Strike after Bloody Thursday. Um, and within a few years, suddenly we've got the ILWU. Bridges was what we would call a socialist. Um, some people called him a communist. Um, he always denied it, and I guess I'll trust him. Um, but, you know, he's on the left. Um, he's uh, not alone, however. Many members of the union that he helps create and lead are also IWW, Trotskyists, communists, others on the left broadly. Why does that matter? Because with their newfound power, the LWU, not just in San Francisco, but up and down the West Coast, instituted a very new system of hiring. The system of hiring traditionally um, in this industry and, and around the world was so-called casual labor, where you get hired by the ship. Then you don't have another job after you finish that ship. Right? You may never work. You may. Right? Um, it's also a system where 20 of us show up for the work, but there's only five jobs, and then we compete against each other for work, and the boss wins because they can pick and choose favorites, they can drive down wages, they can play ethnic and racial groups off of each other, etc. Take bribes. Um, this so-called shape-up was hated by employers, uh, employees, and they get rid of it as soon as they have the ability to do so. They institute what they call a hiring hall, so that now employers will call up the union in each port, say, okay, we want 100 people at Pier 12 tomorrow to work for coffee, um, and then the union dispatches our loyalties come to each other as opposed to our um, sort of employers. 
right? Um, now, what's also interesting about that system is that the members started to decide that we want to decide who among us gets to select who works, right? So we elect our own dispatchers from our membership. And if we don't like them, well, we can vote for someone new the next year, right? And we will also institute a system that they call the low man out, in which if 20 of us show up and there's five jobs, how do we decide who gets those jobs? Whoever has the least amount of work in that quarter of the year gets the first job, right? Um, and so they equalize the work opportunity, not equalize because you may not work, you may not show up for work, but if you show up for work and you get the job if you haven't worked for a while, right? Like uh, um, you might call that Christianity or you might call it socialism, um, but this is the system they institute, right? Um, up and down the coast, right? Um, very, very unusual is perhaps a, an understatement, right? Um, but a radical way to create equality, right? Um, within their ranks. Um, and this operates actually still to this day with significant modifications, but this runs into the 60s, right? Now, in addition to these folks wanting to create an egalitarian system, they also wanted to create a system that was egalitarian regardless of race. Um, that made them very unusual in the 1930s, not unique. There were other unions in the 30s that were also anti-racist, um, but they aren't the majority. Um, and so the LWU also institutes a system where um, they integrate work gangs um, immediately. They start fighting for um, racial equality in other ways I won't go into. Um, and then during World War II, when suddenly there's a huge migration of African Americans from the South into war and industrial cities, including in the Bay Area for shipbuilding. 200,000 people worked building ships in the Bay Area. Right? Um, some of those people ended up on the waterfront, not in the shipyards. And one of them was Cleophus Williams, who became a friend of mine late in his life, uh, moved from rural Arkansas in the early 40s, ends up on the waterfront. What does he find? He finds a union that actually treats him like an equal. Um, in his words, to me, it was probably the first time he'd ever met someone who was not a racist, who was white. Right? I always say, well, honestly, who knows what's in their hearts, what people think. But in action, in policy, and in practice, they treated him equally. Right? He very much appreciated that. In 1967, he became the first African American uh, president of the local that he um, worked in, Local 10, which represents the San Francisco Bay Area. His experience was not unique. Um, in fact, several thousand African Americans found their way to the waterfront in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, found something similar. Not perfect, but actually comparatively amazing, especially within the Bay Area, but also more generally in the United States. Now, um, Local 10, the Bay Area local, was in a way the most progressive when it comes to racial equality. I don't want to give the LWU an entire love fest. Right? And we are mindful that actually some of the other locals historically were um, far less inclusive than Local 10 was. Local 10 was the most important, largest, and biggest, most influential. Right? Um, but Local 8 up in Portland, I know Portland's got a rep now as being sort of groovy. Well, um, not when it comes to race. Um, and uh, LA also has a very interesting history for those of us who are academics. Bruce Nelson wrote actually a great book in which he takes Local 10 to task, excuse me, Local 13 to task um, for really pushing black people out the door after World War II. Um, but uh, anyway, that is what it is. We can talk about those details if one wants. Um, sorry. Gilchester, pictured here on the left, becomes the most prominent African American in the Union in the mid 20th century. And what he does is that, along with many other African Americans in the Union, they start pushing for racial equality within the Bay Area, as well as at the national level, gave a lot of support for the Southern-based civil rights movement provided funds, but also traveled off in um, one of the biggest, well, the biggest protest actually in San Francisco was in 1963 after the, um, in, in solidarity with the Birmingham Freedom Movement in the spring of 63, 30,000 people led by the dock workers actually had this massive, largest uh, event outside of the South um, during that time. Led by these dock workers, um, Paul Robeson became a member, honorary member of ILWU in the 1940s because of his um, similar politics to many in the Union. 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. travels to San Francisco where he's inducted into the Union as an honorary member and speaks at their behalf. Um, the list goes on and on. I could go in, but I'll try to be quick about this. But I could talk for a long time just about that. Um, other sort of ways that this movement, excuse me, this union does really interesting things, especially given one of the issues of our times, gentrification. So San Francisco suffered massive um, redevelopment, which James Baldwin, of course, called Negro removal, um, when federal programs in the 50s and 60s basically wiped out black neighborhoods, including, like you each told me, the interstate that runs through part of St. Paul, 
right? Like, uh, so to in Oakland. But so this also happened in San Francisco, the black neighborhood with the Fillmore. Why did black people end up in the Fillmore? It's because the Japanese Americans were all thrown into camps in World War II. And when blacks move in, they move into literally the old homes of Japanese Americans who were in prison, right? Like, uh, coincidentally. Um, but the Fillmore, still well known, sort of, in San Francisco, um, is blighted and therefore raised thousands of beautiful homes. And um, the San Francisco dock workers take some of their pension funds, buy some of this land, and actually build a worker-friendly housing cooperative that is the first integrated privately private development in the Bay Area. Right? Like, still stands 50 plus years later, the St. Francis Housing Cooperative. Um, so that a thousand people moved into this multiracial working class place where you could afford to buy from its inception, right? like uh, um, if you were working class, right? Because that was the intention of it from its inception. Right? Like uh, um, I will not go further, but um, you get the idea that this union really has done a lot of amazing things in my opinion. Um, in Durban, quite different story. Durban dock workers, similar to the Bay Area dock workers in that they were casual workers, right? They were hired by the ship. Um, in Durban, the working class is all non-white, pretty much. Um, the largest ethnic group in that part of South Africa are Zulus, um, although there's multiple ethnic groups of indigenous peoples, including Pandas, who speak Kosa. Kosa is a language, but it's also an ethnic group, but not some people who are not Kosa speak Kosa. Um, I don't speak Kosa, which is why I don't say Kosa, um, but Kosa with the X, right? Um, are Pandas from what's now called the Eastern Cape, um, black workers, all men, live in housing near the waterfront on the point, which was typical for South Africa, where black migrants to the city, because control to the cities was very tight, um, that uh, live and work together. So on top of all the other reasons I told you why workers get together on the docks, it's also in the case of these folks, they are much more homogenous, um, but also work together, live together, and are really commonly pressed together. Right, like uh, because of race as well as because of class. Uh, dock workers are casual, but dock workers do this time and time again. They stop work collectively. Legally, black workers um, were not allowed to strike. And legally, black workers, once apartheid was created in the late 1940s, are not allowed to be in unions. Um, however, if we all get together in the beer hall after work and say, tomorrow no one show up for work, that's not a strike. Right? Um, because we don't have a job, right? You're not therefore striking a job because you don't have a job, right? If you just all choose not to report for work, it's just the same effect as a strike without it actually legally being a strike, which allowed them to use clever tactics to basically have the same effect, right? Like, and so they're not the only workers who figured this out in South Africa, but they were one of the most important groups. And Durban is the most important port in the country um, the exportation of gold, diamonds, and other things, the importation of other materials. And so Durban's st work stoppages in the 40s and 50s, and by the way, during World War II, they don't give a crap about the war, right? Like, they just, uh, they'll strike during the war um, because it's not their war, right? Like, uh, and so they use their power at a point of production very effectively. Um, and increasingly, in the 40s and 50s, every year or two, basically, these actions are occurring. By the late 50s, after apartheid was instituted, which is just a really worse system of Jim Crow, but even before apartheid, South Africa was already a racist policy society for centuries, but apartheid is sort of when the rest of the world after World War II is sort of becoming more democratic. South Africa's white minority rule becomes, doubles down on fascism, right? Like a, um, and part of that is um, tight state control. Right, um, tight state control, right? Um, and so what do we see resistance to um, apartheid in the 50s, largely peaceful. Um, again, workers can't strike legally who are black, but they can stay away, which is basically a strike by another name, right? Um, and increasingly dock workers don't just strike in order to say get a raise. Um, they also increasingly coordinate their work stoppages, their stay aways with other organizations, including SAC2, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, um, part of the Congress Alliance, which included the better known African National Congress, which was a political organization. SACU was a labor organization, but they were partners, right, in the Congress Alliance, using the same model as the anti-colonial struggle in India, right? Um, and um, so too, as we were talking before, um, uh, during dinner, right, um, what, what's happening in South Africa is also happening in Kenya. It's happening in Senegal, right, like uh, where workers, but often transportation workers, are really important to anti-colonial struggles. 
Um, South Africa is technically independent from 1910, but a lot of us would say 1994 is when South Africa really becomes independent, when it has a multiracial democracy. Um, Durban dock workers are so powerful that basically the city and employers entirely um, change the hiring system. They get rid of casual labor because casual labor actually was a source of strength. And that's interesting because when we think about nowadays, like where power lies, we often use the term precarious, right? That if you don't have a steady job, you're precarious. I understand that, right? But precarity actually, in some ways, well, Casual workers, in some cases, actually do have power if they are able to use their casual nest in interesting ways. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say here. Now, um, I won't go into many more details, but in the 60s, um, in a so-called quiet decade, due to massive repression against anti-apartheid individuals and organizations, basically, there's no resistance to apartheid in the 60s. Literally, everyone's killed, underground, imprisoned, um, or um, silenced. Right? Like, uh, this is called the quiet decade. Um, among South African historians in the sort of mid-60s into the early 70s. There is activism, actually. It's underground, literally, including a small military wing called Spear of the Nation in English, or MK, or Mkonto Wasizwe. Um, a lot of dock workers and unions were very much involved in this, including in Durban. Um, these two men were Durban dock workers who were involved in these matters. Um, but I'm going to highlight quickly that um, Durban dock workers, even though they have suffered repression, in fact, are very important to the resurgence of activism in the 70s in South Africa. Um, I am, uh, I'll talk more about the global struggle in a few minutes. Uh, in 1973, Durban dock workers um, are part of, well, I should say that in late 1972, Durban dock workers go on strike. It's actually a strike as opposed to a ca collective casual work stay away. Um, because by this time they're no longer casual, right? Um, so when they strike in 1969 and then in 72, that's actually a strike. In early 1973 in Durban, the third biggest city in South Africa, workers at another factory go on strike. And that sets off a wave of strikes across Durban, greater Durban, nicknamed in South Africa in history, Durban strikes. Um, and the question among historians is, why did they happen in Durban? Actually, at the time, there was also a question, why did this happen in Durban, not Johannesburg, not Cape Town, not some other part? The answer was, in my opinion, and I'm not quite the first person, but I'm among the first who say it, is because those Durban dockers, in fact, prime the pump, right? Because in late 72, just a month and a half before the big strike wave began, these guys went out, right? Um, and part of my book um, tries to um, contribute to a South African discussion about essentially the resurgence of activism in South Africa in a, a quiet time. I will try to quickly talk about containers, but it's complicated in a lot of ways, but in some ways it's very simple, right? Um, traditionally, people loaded goods or offloaded goods from ships essentially through manual labor. And what we have now, a labor-intensive system being replaced by a capital-intensive system, where we invest in these mega cranes, um, both ship side and sort of off ship, um, and then these metal boxes, 20 to 40 foot standardized containers that you load in away from the waterfront, right? And as opposed to at the waterfront. Um, and then you could sort of standardize this further, right? So that you can move these boxes or containers from ship to rail to truck seamlessly. And that's a revolutionary change. Um, I try not to overuse the word revolution, but really this is a revolutionary change. And although a lot of us think about our smartphones when we think about globalization, we should really be thinking about a seemingly more simple technology, a metal box, right? Um, because without the metal box that is the container, the last 60 years would look very different in the world, right? Like, uh, um, it, of course, in some ways results in the moving of production, of manufacturing from one part of the world to another is the most obvious. It's also predicated on cheap oil, right? Um, but uh, these metal boxes are key, right? Like, uh, it also, of course, results in massive increase in productivity among many sectors of the workforce, especially transport. And so the number of workers required will dramatically be declined over time, too. This is no secret. Right, this is an illustration from the IWU newspaper in the early 60s when they're thinking about basically being replaced by robots or automation. Right? Um, now it's interesting, and like I said, I didn't come to this project intending to do this, but decided to anyway, is because the IWU was literally the first dock worker union in the world, the first maritime union in the world to negotiate the transition. Right? And San Francisco was, at that time, maybe the second biggest port. New York actually, though, was slower to containerize and negotiate. Um, for reasons that I could go into if you want, but like as this happens, 
this is the first place in the world it happens, right? right? And so it's very interesting. Now, one of the effects is actually the port literally jumps from San Francisco to Oakland. And that's important, but I'm not going to talk about that. It's also sort of obvious, right? Like, uh, um, in retrospect. Um, but dock workers, led by Harry Bridges, here talking to the members of Local 10, he has to convince them to go along with this. Now, I always say, among other things, how many times has an employer come to you, your boss, and said, I'd like to do something? Or do they just do it? Right? Um, how many times has an employer said, we want to introduce a new technology in this workplace? What do you think? Right? Like, uh, the idea that actually employers had to negotiate this transition tells us about the power of this union. Right? But also, not necessarily that they're equal players. The question is, how are you going to convince a radical, militant, supposedly left-wing union to go along with this change that will result in fewer people working? That's a good question. Right? Some people say that Nixon, it took Nixon to go to China. Some people have said that it took Harry Bridges to convince dock workers to accept as opposed to try to resist automation. Although, personally, I don't actually think that's the right question to ask. Right? Automation was moving forward. The question is how and who controls it and who benefits from it, not does automation happen. Containerization of one sort or another was going to happen, I, in my opinion. I don't think it wouldn't, it wouldn't have not happened. Right? Like, uh, what Bridges does is he essentially protects that generation. Right? Um, he says not a single worker will be fired. And how do we do that? We shrink from the top. Right? And so essentially employers gave a bunch of money at that time, a bunch of money, um, and they bought out older workers. Right? So they reduced the numbers at first through ret early retirements, uh, as opposed to layoffs. Right? Um, and then, well, they essentially, uh, the transition took a bit longer, um, but uh, also that they wanted big raises. Right? Um, so they got what was referred to by Harry as a share of the machine, which means profit. You may not know this, although you might, uh, but the average dock worker in America gets, makes, makes more money than the average professor and many other workers, right? Like, uh, and that's because although labor costs went down dramatically as a share of the total shipping costs, right? Like, uh, the number of workers went down so much that in fact now that workers often make six figures, right? Like, uh, I'm not upset about that personally. Like, if someone's gonna make money, I'd rather be a worker than an employer. Right, like, uh, but that's the deal, right? I mean, I'm again it's oversimplifying, but uh, this was a significant part of it, right? Um, port moves, it moved in many places. There's no longer a port of New York. It's all in New Jersey, right? There's no more a port of London. Does anyone know the biggest port in England? It's the fifth biggest economy in the world, but you can't name the harbor. Bristol? No, it's it, and it's a new place. It wasn't even a historic port. Um, it's called Felixstowe. Right. Um, yeah, it's a container port, right? Like, uh, and so some places lose, um, some places win, right? Like, uh, that's the way the world. Productivity increases dramatically in the Bay Area. They it, literally the harbor moved, right? Like they built out Oakland. Now, not everyone's happy about this, and sort of to try to bring this section to a close. Um, in the second automation contract, the union went along with a shift to what was referred to or nicknamed steady men where rather than that system called low man out, employers who want to weaken the union as well as pay, um, reduce costs, right? Like uh, say, look, these cranes are fancy, expensive equipment. Not everyone can do it. We need steady workers who we want to train. The union went along with this, uh, although there was some controversy at the time. And as a result, you have some workers who are still dispatched from the hall, but other workers who in fact just report to the same peer every day for months on end, who also not only are becoming more loyal to that one employer, but also actually working more hours, and so therefore earning more money, right? Like, uh, and so that's a wedge, right? That wedge still exists within this union. Uh, so although this union is still progressive and relatively egalitarian, this change, which was not necessary, you could dispatch crane operators through the hall. You wouldn't have to have stay, right? I could. All of you know how to drive. All of you could probably learn how to drive a crane, right? Like, uh, and so that was an argument made that the union went along with. Um, Herb Mills, just passed away two years ago, was a um, dock worker from Detroit um, who uh, ended up in California and became the leading critic of Harry Bridges within the union. He also had a PhD that he picked up along the way, but he never was a professor because he didn't want to be a professor. He instead, as soon as he got his PhD, went back into the union that was his love. But Herb then ends up leading a, a big charge against Harry Bridges in the late 60s um, that results in when Bridges recommends a third contract that 96% uh, of the workers vote against Bridges' recommendation and go on strike in 1971-72, the longest strike in the history of America's maritime industry. But it didn't actually change the conditions of employment in a significant way. It was not a victory, even though it's noteworthy that workers were angry, uh, but 
weren't able any longer to perhaps change that. Now, just uh, I'll do quickly go to talk about Durban. Durban, very different. Dock workers don't have power in the same way that they do in the Bay Area. Dock workers don't have union, and this country, this apartheid regime, institutes containerization simultaneously around the country. Very state-driven, right? Like a good fascist state. Um, and so they introduce containers a bit later. South Africa is not central to the world economy, so this doesn't happen until the mid late 70s, right? Um, inside of three years, 50% of the workers fired, um, and not a dime in increased wage, right? Like so, quite different. So sometimes comparative histories show similarities, and other times they show difference. This is an example of the latter. So much so that by the 80s, even though the, literally the dock workers of Durban had been perhaps the most militant group of workers, in addition to gold miners, for 100 years, they are quiet, right? So in the 80s, which is a time when basically the anti-apartheid movement explodes in South Africa, led really by black workers, um, Durban dockers are not part of that, right? They are um, a shadow of their former selves. Um, of course, nowadays, sometimes there's a great film that came out about 10 years ago about shipping called The Forgotten Space, we still live in this world, right, like uh, of, of containerized, where we are all dependent upon the stuff that we all consume is moved by ship, right, um, for a significant part of its journey, right? Um, in other words, although the number of workers has declined, this, the, the strategic nature of this industry remains, yeah, um, which we can talk more about as one wishes. Um, I'll try to be quickly through this third and final theme of this notion of transnational activism, transnational activism. So most workers in the Bay Area by the 1960s who work on the waterfront are African American. Local 10 was 99% white at its birth. That is not an exaggeration, right? Within a generation, it was majority black. That is not coincidence, right? It's actually intentional on the part of the union to actively recruit among people of color, right? And I highlight that point because um, African American dock workers in the Bay Area are part of a long tradition of maritime sailors and dock workers who are of African descent or African. Um, Usman Semben, the picture on the left of a uh, Senegalese filmmaker, but who had worked as a Marseille docker in the 50s. Um, Claude McKay, the Jamaican on the right, who also worked and wrote a famous novel called Banjo about Marseille in the 1920s, set in Marseille in the 1920s. Langston Hughes was a black sailor. Marcus Garvey worked as a dock worker in London before he went back and formed uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. There's a lot of interesting right, um, black people who have worked in this industry and they are often, that's how they became more cosmopolitan and some of them internationally minded, not all, but some, right? And of course, as a sort of connected to these two things but somewhat separate, this notion of pan-Africanism, um, here are African Americans protesting against the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, less well known than um, those who protest against the sort of fascists in Spain, right, like uh, same era. I'm going to focus for a few minutes on how the Bay Area dock workers are part of the global struggle against apartheid. It's actually a um, fascinating story. And um, I say that after the 19th century, which the great social movement of the 19th century was the abolition of slavery worldwide, but especially in the Atlantic world, right? Like uh, that in the post World War II era, the great social movement is the anti apartheid movement. Right? Um, and if we're thinking about nowadays and social movements, and we might be thinking about climate as one such social movement, Everyone should be studying the anti-apartheid movement, right? Like, actually, some already have, right? Um, the idea of divestment comes out of this, right, um, uh, for example. What's interesting, however, is that we may not think about what workers might have to do with this, right? Um, what workers might have to do with this. But, of course, many of us would say that, well, maybe our greatest power is at work. Right? Um, especially if we're willing to stop work. Right? Um, and so um, dock workers in many places for different reasons, but I'm focusing on this one place and this one issue, right? dock workers in the Bay Area are the first American workers to use their work pays power, which is to stop work, right? um, to support the struggle against apartheid. In 1962, Bill Chester collaborating with civil rights groups in the Bay Area, um, including this white woman, Mary Louise Hooper, who was a, an American radical who had been expelled from South Africa for being an ally of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, uh, comes back to the US and helps, um, gets immediately involved in the struggle here. Um, and dock workers standing behind them could have walked through this handful of pickets, right, of elderly women walking uh, on the pier, but instead, of course, respect the picket that these um, community groups throws up because Bill Chester, of course, had greased the wheels and had 
tell people, well, this is what's going to happen today. Right? Um, we're not going to work this ship full of South African cargo in order to protest apartheid, the first time in the history of the United States that workers had done such a thing. Fast forward to the 70s, Leo Robinson, pictured on the left, I got to meet him just once, although it was for one full day, um, uh, before he passed away four years ago. Um, Leo Robinson, along with the guys in this container in 1977, helped form the Southern Africa Liberation Support Committee. The first time a, an American labor union members decided that they wanted to create a rank and file committee committed to the idea of liberation in Southern Africa, not South Africa, because let us remember that Zimbabwe is not yet free. Right? Let us remember that Mozambique is not yet free. Let us remember that Namibia is not yet free. Right? Southern Africa was the last part of the continent to be free. Right? Um, Leo and others are aware of this. They're intellectuals, even though they're working class peoples. Right? Um, and to organize this committee, they want to educate their members. They want to educate others in the barrier and up and down the coast. Um, in 1984, they show a documentary film, hard to find, but still worth seeing, Last Grave at Dimbaza. Has anyone seen it? Not surprising. Um, hard to find. So basically, you watch this hour film, and you think, I cannot believe how horrible apartheid is. What can I do about it? Right? Like, uh, that's the purpose of the film. It was made by activists in 73 and smuggled out of the country and used in the 70s and 80s as a tool right, to show people what's apartheid about. Right? Um, they show this film at the October meeting of Global 10. Um, to 400 men, um, and then as soon as the film ends, someone by plan raises a hand and goes, I suggest we boycott the next cargo ship that has South African stuff on it. Unanimous vote, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, a few weeks later, shortly after Ronald Reagan was re-elected in a landslide, um, this ship comes into San Francisco and it's not containerized, that's important. Um, they're able to pick out which cargo is from South Africa, which isn't. And essentially refused to work the South African cargo for 10 days as the Bay Area starts to explode. This becomes pivotal to the Bay Area anti-apartheid struggle. Fast forward six years, the movement grows in South Africa and the world. ANC and other political parties unbanned. Political prisoners start to get released. The most well-known was that man, Nelson Mandela, with his then-wife, Winnie. Um, he travels the world in a victory lap to various countries. His first country he visits, by the way, Cuba. Um, but he does later get to the United States, spends 10 days, 1990, in the summer of 1990, I was living in New York City. He came to New York City in the summer of 90. I was a dumb college student. I did not attend Nelson Mandela's speech. Um, but in Oakland, where he got later, he and Winnie um, hung out uh, for a few days um, and spent 10% of his speech before 60,000 people thanking Local 10 of the LW um, for their activism on the behalf of South Africa. Last thing I'll tell you about, a little more recent, you might know something about this one. 1980s, dock workers start to organize into a union, but it's not really until 2000 that a union, a strong national union in transportation is formed, what's still around today, the South African Transport and Alive Workers Union. There's a man wearing IWW um, there, like I didn't point it out earlier, but we could go back to local tens hall. An injury to one is an injury to all. If you've ever been to San Francisco's local 10 hall, I have. This banner is um, sort of hanging from, and it's the motto of, that's an old IWW motto that now many other unions have adopted, including in South Africa, an injury to one is an injury to all. Because guess what, Wobblies ended up in Southern Africa in the 19 teens and brought their motto with them. In 2008, Next door to South Africa, just to the north, Robert Mugabe was still president in Zimbabwe. Mugabe just passed away, actually, like a month ago, right? Um, although he'd been deposed a year prior. Uh, Mugabe is a complicated figure, yeah? Like, uh, was a liberation struggle leader. Um, then when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe in 1980, famously Bob Marley sang at the uh, ceremony, right? Like, has a song called Zimbabwe, right? Like, uh, that Zimbabwe became a border country to South Africa instantly a frontline state in support of the struggle against apartheid, right? Many ANC and other um, uh, exiled people were based in Zimbabwe, right? Like, everyone knows this. Subsequently, of course, uh, really in the 2000s, Zimbabwe's economy starts to tank, its political system starts to become more repressive. Millions of Zimbabweans end up in South Africa. Either you might call them economic refugees, you might call them political refugees, you might just call them actually moving across a border that the British created not that long prior, there's actually people of the same ethnic group on both sides of that line, 
right? In the same way that there's Mexicans on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border, right? Like, uh, and so Zimbabwe and uh, South Africa have a similar relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, right? A wealthier country next to a poorer country, therefore poor people look for work in the wealthier place. Surprise, right? Like, uh, but also there's a lot of cultural, political, and other affinities between these two places. I say this because as what's happening in Zimbabwe, millions of South Africans are paying attention but sympathetic to the opposition, right? Um, including many in the labor movement who are supporting the opposition who's led by a man named Morgan Zangarai, who's um, actually a union leader, who um, arguably wins the presidential election of 2008, but then Mugabe uses military and police power to kill hundreds of people, injure thousands of people, intimidate the masses of Zimbabweans to potentially vote for Mugabe in the second round. And it's at this moment, a Chinese ship comes into Durban full of weapons destined for Zimbabwe, right? Um, Zimbabwe is landlocked, right? It has to get stuff through Mozambique or South Africa, but generally South Africa, because it's a bigger, more, um, the, trans, uh, the networks of tr routes are better, right? Um, this ship comes in and Durban dock workers refuse to unload this cargo. Uh, when I interviewed the leaders of the province uh, union in 2010, two years later, they gave me multiple reasons why. One, these bullets are gonna kill our fellow workers. Um, two, these people helped us when we were suffering in the era of apartheid, right? Um, three, I forget, uh, I'll give you two. Right? Like, uh, um, but uh, what we see is essentially this incredible moment, right, of transnational activism in which dock workers once more are involved. Um, now, we might think about these as sort of ancient history. There's other struggles in the world today. One of them, perhaps, that many of us are sympathetic to is the Conditions of Palestinians in the West Bank, and especially the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip might be the largest prison in the world, right? A million people who can't move, right, in this little postage stamp place. Um, and um, it is not surprising that South Africans in particular are very critical of Israeli treatment of Palestinians. When South Africans talk about Israel, they are very clear. Now in America, the people don't like using the apartheid comparison to Israel, and I understand that. I also happen to be Jewish, right? Um, however, the idea that South Africans are the first to call this apartheid should tell us something, right? Like, uh, and so maybe it's not surprising that Durban dock workers, but also San Francisco Barrier dock workers, have repeatedly refused to work cargo from an Israeli-owned shipping line called Zim, coincidentally, Z-I-M, Zim line, right? Um, and you might even remember in 2014 when um, the last time, not the last time, but one of the times that Israel was bombing the Gaza Strip, and um, as an Israeli ship came in in the summer of 14, the Oakland, they uh, blocked the boat, that was the term used at that time. Right? Um, you might even remember earlier this summer when dock workers in France and Italy refused to load weapons aboard a Saudi ship that was uh, going to use those guns in order to kill the Yemenis. Right? Like, uh, and so even in recent times, there have been dock workers who have engaged in these political actions, often in coordination with civil society groups. Um, not necessarily, uh, there's different ways this plays. Right, um, but um, even up until our time, right, there's been examples of political activism among dock workers where ordinary people are exerting political power right, um, on foreign relations, something that we usually cede to our central governments. And so I won't bore you with the historiographical conclusions. Um, hopefully you appreciate what I've been trying to do is to understand how powerful dock workers are. But let us not forget, as I said early, that it's not just dock workers, it's actually other types of workers too who work especially in the supply chain. Warehouse workers, in fact, are weak. Warehouse workers get paid poorly. Warehouse workers are not in unions. It doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, dock workers, there's no magic about controlling trade at this particular node of a supply chain. It's just that, that they already were there, right? Like the point being that logistics is a really important center. And that's why, of course, I appreciate, as you each said earlier um, yesterday, right, where Amazon workers here in um, the Twin Cities um, stop work for a while in order to exert power, Amazon being the logistics company of our time, right, like basically. Yeah. Um, we also see how workers have used power to fight for social justice causes, not just to improve their own conditions, not that I'm opposed to that, right, uh, but that workers also have power to help others. Right? Um, and that even in our time, while workers, including myself, are still dealing with technological change, right? um, talk to a professor about um, online teaching, right? like, uh, and we could have a long conversation, a boring conversation, but a long conversation. Um, so boring that this gentleman can't keep it up. Right? Like, uh, so like, uh, what we've got is transnational social movements, right? um, and I hope you see the implications for other workers as well. Um, I 
thank you so much for your attention um, and appreciate uh, your patience. And if anyone still wants to talk, I'm happy to do that. Too. Um, I can call on if anyone wishes to make a comment or a question. Um, I'm all ears, especially if you tell me first what your name is. Please. Um, my name is Claire. I'm a union carpenter in the Twin Cities. Um, and I'm wondering about like the impact of wars on unions and art, like organizing. Mm. Because you mentioned that during the Great Depression, that was like a time um, when these unions organized. And in my union, I've often been fed this line that like World War II saved the union, and like we were gonna fall apart before it, and then all these jobs came and really strengthened the union. Mm. And I'm always like, that kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like feeding this military-industrial system that's mm -hmm. like creating jobs for people, yes. and like how how do you like combat that? Mm. I, that's a great question. I don't know if I have a great answer. Um, but I would, uh, pointing back to this own industry, right, like where during, for instance, the war in Vietnam, this union was officially opposed to the war in Vietnam. Many members of the union were personally opposed to the war in Vietnam. I should also say that many of these people were veterans uh, of various wars, but like, uh, and military service, but um, they were benefiting because guess what port was shipping out um, cargo and people to Southeast Asia? Right, um, San Francisco Bay, right? Like, uh, and so the carpenters are hardly the only group of workers who um, live in a complicated world where, in fact, uh, you know, you might oppose this, but in fact, benefit from this, right? Like, uh, now personally, um, the uh, I know a little about the carpenters, but not so much, right? Like, it is ironic that war economies often, at least in the short term, are prosperous, right? Like. Uh, Longer term, that's a, a fair question to ask. The massive debts that incurred um, is something that we could consider, even though we don't think about it. We often, because that's not us individually, but our community or our nation, right? Like, a, but like, you know, for the LWU also, that's taken up in principled stands against war. There's also the danger of if you um, oppose war, you might have the power of the police state come down on you, right? Like. A, um, and so that was very much the case in Korea, where actually Harry Bridges spoke out against the war. Um, and there was actually hearings in Congress, and there was talk about trying to deport Bridges, and um, or, uh, in fact, thousands of left-wing American workers in the maritime industry were screened off of their jobs, losing their jobs, right? Um, and sailing maritime as ships as well as docks. Right, like, uh, and so it's a dangerous game, right? Like, uh, if you if you um, speak out against uh, a government in wartime, rarely do governments tolerate dissent, right? Like, that's the nature of the beast, right? Like, uh, the solution might be therefore not in a particular workplace or union even, but actually, I'm not anti-political. Like, having a society that actually doesn't treat dissenters in horrible ways, regardless of whatever their constitution may or may not say, right? Like. Uh, um, because that's an important matter, right? Like, I don't have a good, like I said, answer. I mean, uh, I think uh, it's hardly carpenters are alone in sort of short-term benefit that might, in fact, in the big picture, might not sound so good, right? I would also say, someone not a pacifist, um, some wars are worth fighting, and if I had to pick one, World War II would have been the one, right? Like, uh, and so, like, that was, in my opinion, uh, uh, appropriate, um, and, yeah, that's just my opinion, right? Like, uh, but I, I'd like to think that I would have been fighting um, if I was alive in that time. But most wars I don't think, but I think actually World War II is a little, right? Like, uh, not for the Africans I was talking about. They were just colonial pawns, right? Like, uh, but in societies, you know, better, more democratic, well, the people supported that war, right? Like, uh, I might have just gone off on this terrible tangent that made everyone hate me. Uh, but like, uh, yeah, like, I mean, World War II is a sort of exceptional in, in, in the history of America in terms of warfare, right? Like, uh, um, yeah. I don't know, what do you think? I feel differently about World War II. Mm. Um, but that's a long tangent. I, I was 
curious like why the Great Depression was a time where there was a lot of organizing. Now that's a good question too. And um, so there's a bunch of factors, but anger, right, um, uh, at the sort of the oppression that many Americans suffered. Also, I think organizing, political organizing, so that people are going, why is this happening? And I think correctly, a lot of people, especially on the left, said, this is actually not surprising. This is, in fact, part of capitalism, right? Um, and so it's not coincidence that a number of people, not just in the US, but in other places that were suffering depression, didn't just have a, I want a raise or I want government relief, but actually, I think the system is sort of the problem, right? Like a um, Communist Party in the US and many other countries was at their largest in the 30s, right? Because capitalism has failed. You didn't have to convince anyone by reading Marx. You could just go look down the street, right? Like, uh, and so they also had an FDR, again, may or this may not be popular, I don't know, the most pro-worker president that the United States has ever had, right? Like, uh, could he have been better? Sure, but like, <laughs> the fact that worker rights were created in the 30s, now I would say that's partially from below, not just from above, right? Like, uh, but um, you didn't have an anti-union president, right? Uh, which is rare. Yeah, um, and so in America, specifically in the 30s, you had social movements, you had sort of um, collective uh, suffering, right? Um, but also like good political organizing on the part of a lot of different groups, including the Communist Party, um, that help us understand why that becomes, right, like a sort of a, a, a moment, right? Like a, then once it becomes more anti-fascist, more popular front, that even broadens the tent more and more activism is happening in the mid late 30s. Of course, it's also a time when, again, Spain is happening and Ethiopia is happening and uh, um, in the short term, of course, the fascists are winning, right? Like, uh, but um, there's things to organize against, right? Like, uh, um, I think it's part of it, um, yeah. Sir. Well, I got a problem with FDR. Sure. I'm starting with that, but I'll skip over that for now to bridges. Mm. There's a couple points that I'd like to bring out that in the strike on the West Coast, the general strike that he led, basically, and there's a lot of thought that he gave him way too early. He had a role going there that he could have kept going, he could have got a lot more, mm. and labor could have won, and they just kind of settled. Mm. And then I'd like to throw Sorry, you're talking about 1934. 34. Yeah. And then the other one is uh, another guy you probably heard of him a little bit, Stan Weir. He wasn't too happy with Bridges. If he was <laughs> around today, uh, we'd be talking a little different about him. Mm. And uh, he got stung real bad by him, and he fought it for years, but they lost. He was a B-man instead of an, he was promised a job as an A-man, or you know, a position as an A-man, but they kept him as a B-man, and then the B-man, they just got rid of him, mm. drum, dropped him. So Stan might have a little different opinion on him too. So. I don't know if he was such a great guy, though. I got a lot of questions about him. I mean, he was sure. progressive, but mm. just uh, to a certain point, and it benefited him. And sorry, your name is? What? Your name? Steve. Steve. Fellow worker Steve, Eurista. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, you know, in 34, could Bridges, he wasn't, in, he came out of the ranks and became the leader, right? Um, yeah. But could they have gotten more? Probably, uh, I mean, that's, that's impossible. That's like a counterfactual, right? Like, could this have been different? Yes, could, um, you know, it was when, it, when in 1934, to go just um, the example, right? Like, it's a coast-wide strike of these maritime workers, but then it, after um, several are killed by the San Francisco police, it becomes a citywide general strike, right? Um, and Bridges isn't in control of the general strike, really, it's AFL. Right, um, and um, a lot of people, the AFL is not being driving it, they're being pulled, you might say, but they pull the flag. Bridges, I don't think the dock workers really could have controlled the general strike because they didn't control the city's workforce, right? Um, there was sympathy for the repression, and I should also note that there was police repression in other port cities at the same time, right? Um, but, you know, um, they ended up getting uh, significant raises they got a union recognition, they got a hiring hall, they got a lot. Um, partially because of also, we should give a shout out to Frances Perkins, the first female cabinet secretary who was Secretary of Labor, who was part of that negotiation process. 
So in my opinion, I don't honestly know 34 as well. It's my book's not about bridges or 34, but like, I don't personally sort of call that a loss or could they have done better prop? Maybe, right? Like now the other question that Steve asked about is an important one and actually very much off in a sort of a side that I chose not to explore. I, Stan Weir was a now deceased sort of radical worker, um, but also an intellectual who wrote extensively, including about the industry that I do. I use his work. I think he's a great writer and deep thinker. Um, and, but in the early 60s, Bridges, who was elected time and again by the membership, but was not the idea that he kept running for office, he served in the presidency for almost 40 years. That's problematic, right? Like uh, um, locals, in fact, don't allow that. But at the international level in the IW, at that time, there were no term limits. But actually, at the local level, they required local presidents and local elected leaders to rotate back into the ranks, right? That's more wobbly, but like at the international level, that wasn't the case, right? Um, and so Bridges didn't steal any elections, but he also stayed a really long time, right? Like. Uh, and he didn't love dissent, even though he often actually had an open door policy. And um, yeah, he, he wasn't abusive and he actually was one of the lowest paid union leaders in the country. But, you know, he, he didn't like Weir because Weir was a smart guy who was leading some uh, sort of opposition from within in ways. And so a group of people were purged who, um, Steve was talking about these B-men as uh, ultimately wanted to be an A-man. Um, that was messy, and I honestly don't know if we even know what happened, right? Like, I've talked to a number of people about it, and it's complicated is one word I would use, right? Like, uh, but I think that a number of men were fair, unfairly treated, including Stan. Um, when Stan Weir chose to sue the union, uh, well, I think he later admitted that that was a mistake. Like, you don't take your sort of grievance within workers to sort of essentially the, the state but he did, um, and that created further dissension and conflict and dislike amongst these different parties. Um, I think Weir was wrong when he said it was a racist act. Um, Weir was white, but most of the people purged in that wave were black men because most of the people being recruited were black. Um, African American members of the IW loved Harry Bridges like no other group, like Bridges really had huge support among blacks because of the reasons I was talking about earlier. But I think on the containerization issue, I'm very critical of him, and Weir was too, so that's a separate matter from this A-man, B-man thing. And, well, yeah, there's more than one way to interpret. Yeah, like, uh, but I agree with you that Weir would have a different view of Local 10 than I do, right? Like, uh, um, and, and I respect a lot of his critique of automation and how it played out, right? I think that's important. I spend a significant part of one chapter thinking about how workers in the industry were criticizing Bridges for these, how automation moved forward. It's a um, very interesting subject. And, and the, what, the only thing I'll say before asking for another question is, I think Bridges' mistake was actually not pushing for uh, reduced work hours, right? Like, and so um, how do you save more jobs? And I think this speaks to our time too. I think the, the four hour day actually is the goal at this point. Um, but the six hour day should have been, they should have been pushing to save more work by spreading the work around more, which was a depression era strategy, but wasn't seriously being talked about in the 60s. Um, and I think that is a sign that Bridges was not as radical in the 60s as he had been in the 30s. He's not only the person like that. And really, the 60s are different. And going back to this comment, the war in Vietnam is going on, and the US government will use any means necessary in order to keep the war machine going. And so, the union's in a sort of tough spot in that, like, if you oppose, um, if you stop work, et cetera, well, you might actually just get crushed because the U.S. Army is stronger than the LW, right? Like, I mean, uh, if you're one to use guns, game over, right? Like, and so I think actually Bridges was very mindful that in a Cold War era that ILW is very isolated, and as the war is escalating, that their cards are somewhat limited because the state would use whatever power it had to essentially escalate the war in Vietnam, right? Like, and so um, the context, I think, actually is um, not to justify it, but the Cold War era is, we can't forget, like, um, I'm not saying you forget it, but like, uh, it's the Cold War, I mean, the state used incredible power to sort of weaken social movements, right? Like, uh, um, and Bridges is aware of that, right? Like, uh, yeah, um, I imagine you have something else you want to say too, but maybe if someone else, um, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, please. Um, hi. Um, 
I was curious to know if you could speak more to the relationship between dock workers and sailors and the and like what sailors sort of participation and or not participation might have been in these mm. kinds of um, yeah. actions. I only think of this as my dad was a member of the, in the British Merchant Navy and was in Durban during apartheid and told stories about it. But, wow. So, yeah. Well, I'd love to hear those. Yeah. Um, so dock workers and sailors, same industry, they talk to each other all the time. The container era now is very different, right? So like now ships turn around very quickly. It used to be that ships would be in harbor for days, weeks, sometimes longer, right? So those sailors come off, they're socializing with who? Dock workers, right? Like, of course, right? Um, and English was sort of a lingua franca, especially in the British imperial world, right? And so those South Asian dock workers might have been able to speak English to these Durban dock workers, which is important to think about. Um, in the Bay Area too, right? Like, I mean, sailors were very traditionally heavily unionized. There are still unions, but because of globalization, but also sort of the ability of companies in the industry to sort of essentially register their ships with any country they wish, they can get around strong country labor law for weak country labor law, like half the country ship, ships of the world are registered in Panama, right? Like, uh, which is sort of a weak labor uh, market, for instance, right? Um, and so sailors unions still exist, but are a shell compared to one or really two or three generations ago. Dock workers union, by contrast, actually have held on much more strongly. And it depends on the place, but like, um, so sailors unions still exist, but really, they're not quite a thing of the past, but they're somewhat of a thing of the past in terms of power. But many former sailors are dock workers, right? Like, I mean, so the phrase is a snug harbor, snug, S-N-U-G, right? Well, what do you do? You're sailing. Right, your years, right? You're away from home. Maybe you want to start a family. Maybe you just are tired of sort of this type of life. But what work do you end up doing? Well, like Harry Bridges, you just end up staying in one port and working in the same industry, right? Like, and so many a former sailor is a dock worker, right? Like, not nowadays. That's not the case, really. But historically, that was a typical path. And the people. So, in other words, they were often the same people. Um, they often lived in the same neighborhoods, hung out in the same neighborhoods, waterfront neighborhoods. Now think about basically often gentrified because the ports have moved out of, but the oldest parts of port cities are generally the waterfront neighborhoods, which generally were working class neighborhoods and were generally really cool places, right? And where, yeah, you could um, get a bite to eat, you could um, find a bed to sleep in, you could find some sexual companionship, whatever your preference is, right? Because what are you not getting on the ship, right? Well, of course you're getting some of that on the ship too, right? But like. It's harbor towns, sailor towns is where this happened. And guess where, when I go into, guess where the beats ended up in North Beach? Maritime area. Where were the Beatles playing in Hamburg? St. Pauli, right? The neighborhood that's the harbor area, right? Like, I mean, you go around the world, it's always the same. It's like, these are really interesting places because there's um, people transgress, right? Like, uh, and uh, if you've got the money, we'll supply the need, right? Like, uh, and so um, sailors and dock workers hung out together, they drank together, they probably slept together. One thing going back to comments about the McCarthy era, the Red Scare of the post-World War II era, is that the LWU took in leftists from sailors' unions that, in fact, were being fired, right? Like, uh, and so they reinvigorated their radicals in a way. This wasn't a conscious policy, but they were open to people that many other employers weren't, right? And remember, the dock workers are the dispatchers, right? Not the bosses, right? And so. The last thing I'll say about that is one of the coolest unions around, right, was the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, MCS, uh, which was um, uh, cooks and stewards, right, not dex hands, not engine room people. Um, a lot of these people were homosexual, right? Maybe a third of the membership of MCS was gay, openly gay, right? Like, uh, they were also anti-racist, right, um, and had women, right? And the MCS was a, uh, so you had communist gay black men, right, um, and white. Uh, and this union was crushed in the early 50s by the federal government. And a lot of those MCS people ended up in the out of view, right? Um, and so literally the people who had been, including the, the president right after Bridges was a guy named Jimmy Herman who came out of the Cooks Union, although he was a white guy. Um, and I don't know if he was gay or not, um, but he was uh, out of that union who then had ended up in out of view, right? Um, and so that's a very interesting relationship, very direct in the case of the Bay Area. But I suspect there's other examples like that in other countries, right, in other ports. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Please. Um, maybe a little bit off what you asked. Um, if 
uh, you're a dock worker, you love it, you're working in San Francisco, at any time, if you decided you wanted to go to another part of the world and be a dock worker, were there formal mechanisms in order to do that? <laughs> Your name is? Carol. Do you like to travel? Uh, yes, when I can. <laughs> um, so the LWU, I hate to you know crush on the LWU, but like, so they have this, this it's still in effect, like this thing where you can travel, right? And so in many unions, which are more craft-based, not industrial-based, and more sort of narrow in their sort of priorities, Right, you can't transfer locals. Right, you have to pay a new initiation fee, and you, there's no guarantees. IWU, I know guys, right, um, like uh, who lived in San Francisco, but they liked LA, and so they could report at the LA local just because they wanted to, right? Um, and so they could basically show up at any of the ports where IWU controlled the dispatch and get work. And I heard about stories from some ports where guest workers, if you will, right, got first jobs, right, like, so they tried to treat their, of course, this is also a great way for pe people across the union to get to know each other, to organize, et cetera, et cetera, but for some people who I've talked to, it was just like, well, they just wanted to take a break from maybe the weather in the Bay Area to have uh, some time in LA, right, like, uh, and you could, right, you could also transfer permanently, although that was a different process, right, um, but you could visit, but they called it traveling, right? Like, uh, and you also, of course, as casual workers, because they didn't give up casual, if they want to take a two-week break, they don't ask anybody, right? Like, they actually just don't report for work for two weeks and go to the Sierras and go backpacking with their kids, right? Like, uh, or if you want to go to the track on Mondays, you go to the track, right? Like, and if you want to work weekends, because in fact you get paid time and a half on weekends, you just report on the weekends, right? Like, and so. Who among us who's a worker, and most, all of us are workers, wouldn't want to have that sort of control, right? And so that's another example of how if you have enough work, the casual, in fact, ain't so bad, right? Like, uh, obviously, in the building trades, there's some of that similarities too, right? Because work is irregular in some ways, right? Sometimes that's not by choice, right? Like, uh, but the idea that you get to decide when you work, well, that sounds pretty good, right? Like, so that's separate from which port you show up to, but it's sort of connected, right? Like, because um, Union, the union card allowed you flexibility, right? like in some very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah, mm. um, so I think you said the ILWU at one time went through a name change, Longshoreman. Yeah. Uh, so um, what was kind of the entry point for women, and, and what did they first do? Mm. And what's the new name? Well, it's now International Longshore and Warehouse. They just cut out the men in those two words, longshore and warehouse, right? I should note the East Coast Gulf Coast Dock Worker Union that they split away from, the International Longshore Men's Association, is still called the International Longshore Men's Association, right? Like, a, but so it was in the 90s, the late 90s, and it was uh, unanimous at the convention vote. Although who knows what people thought? Maybe there were some people who were not as open to that. But it actually, the convention voted on that name change. Um, you know, like. Some people would say, I think this is somewhat sexist, but like, you know, the nature of the industry allows for less emphasis on, um, on brute strength, which means that maybe some men can feel like women can do the work too, even though women could have done the work before, right? Like, uh, and so containerization in some ways has de-emphasized the, the manual labor part of it, although it's still actually a relatively dangerous job, it's less dangerous, and that therefore you know, it's okay if women come in. Of course, in the 70s, right, when laws are starting to be passed that force employers to be non-sex discriminatory, that goes back to the 60s with the Civil Rights Act of 64, but also then continues in some early 70s federal legislation. You know, it starts to become, especially including in the building trades, right, like an issue, right? There's also the issue that women, working class people, want access to good paying work, Right, as well as people of color, right? So in the 60s and 70s, there was a number of struggles over getting into unions, not just that we want equal access to university, but also for those who choose or can't go to university, that they also have equal opportunity in the work, right? Like, uh, but it's in the 90s, really, that in this industry, but going back in the 70s, we see women, they're still a heavily majority industry of men. LWU, and I should say Satawu in South Africa have made some significant efforts to sort of bring women into the industry, and there's actually like a ILW women YouTube video you can watch if you want, right? Um, and yeah, so still heavily male, 
but actually it was thanks to also some male activists within the union, including Leo Robinson, who are pushing for better treatment of women. Um, yeah, and now there's women checkers and women cargo, uh, you know, women are, uh, there's not yet been a, women, a woman elected to the international ranks. And I have to think about it at the local level. In ILW Canada, which is British Columbia, does have at least one female among its elected leadership. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Well, I'm not going to run away, so if anyone wants to ask more personal questions, I'm happy to sort of stick around um, and do that. But I'll just thank you once more for your attention on Friday night.